Now coming to analgesic ladder. Analgesic ladder is a very important topic, especially for all the doctors, nurses, medical students. They must know about analgesic ladder because it guides you that how do you have to proceed and go ahead in a patient having pain and which drugs that you have to use initially. And how do you proceed ahead? Now, WHO analgesic ladder divides it into four steps. Step 1, step 2, step 3, step 4. In the step 1, is it says that if the patient is experiencing pain, that you should start from lower potency drugs. And these lower potency drugs have lower side effect profile. And then you go ahead and the higher the uh, you go above the ladder, the more side effects it are. The pain relief will be much better on the higher end. but there will be more side effects as well on the higher end. In the step 1, it says that if the patient is experiencing pain, then you should start the pain management from non-opiate analgesia like NSAIDs. And NSAIDs are continued in each step. These NSAIDs are non-opiate analgesia form the base of this whole ladder. Now, this non-opiate analgesia will be continued in step 2, it will be continued in step 3 and it will be continued in step 4 because it reduces the need of other opiate drugs. It reduces the need of the drugs that have more side effect profiles. So, usually the non-opiate analgesia like NSAIDs in the step 1 are combined with the other step medications. With non-opiate analgesia like NSAIDs, it also recommends adding adjuvant drugs and adjuvant drug also form the base of this ladder and they are added in each and every step like step 1, 2, 3, 4 in each step these adjuvant drugs are also added. These adjuvant drugs include tricyclic antidepressants that are involved in neuropathic pain. Uh, it also includes SNRIs like duloxetine. It includes muscle relaxants. We will discuss each one of the adjuvant drugs as well. In the step 2, we have weak opiates. Now, if the patient's pain is not being controlled by non-opiate analgesia like NSAIDs, then you can move ahead and you can escalate your treatment to weak opiates like tromadol, or hydroxycodone and codeine. These are weak opiates. But remember, opiates have their own side effects. And with weak opiates, you also have to continue these NSAIDs and N uh, adjuvant drugs because they reduce the need, they reduce the dose of the opiates. So, you can uh, provide pain relief to the patient with smaller doses. In the step 3, if the patient pain is not being controlled with weak opiates, you go ahead and you give strong opiates and strong opiates include oxycodone, morphine and fentanyl and they are stronger than these opiates. Then in the step 4, if the patient's pain is not being controlled by all of these strategies, then the other step 4 methods are a bit invasive methods, methods like interventional treatment that involve nerve block giving analgesia and directly blocking the nerve. Patient control analgesia pump, IV infusions are started and patient controls that at the time when the patient is experiencing pain, he starts the uh, analgesia, he starts the infusion and a certain amount of infusion is given to the patient, then the further infusion is stopped. That is patient control analgesia, spinal cord stimulation, patient having chronic neuropathic pain, uh, chronic stimulation is given to the spinal cord to antagonize the stimulation that is coming from the pain. And remember, the important point is that these non-opiate analgesia and adjuvant drug, drugs form the basis of this whole ladder. In the non-opiate analgesics, acetaminophen, the paracetamol is very important. It is a very safe drug. It can be given in pregnancy. It can be given to multitude of patients except the patients with liver disease. In liver disease patients, you cannot give it. 325 to 1000 mg per orally every 4 to 6 hours is given with a maximum dose of 4000 mg per day. You cannot give it more than 4000 mg per day because there is a chance that it might cause hepatotoxicity. And it is to be avoided in patients that are having liver failure or active hepatic disease. Other than these patients, you can give acetaminophen and it's a very good drug. It has analgesic properties. It is not an NSAID. It does not have any anti-inflammatory properties, but it works as a good analgesic. Coming to NSAIDs, in the NSAIDs we have ibuprofen and naproxen. Remember in the NSAIDs, ibuprofen and naproxen are the first line drugs due to the, their safety and low side effects as compared to other NSAIDs. Ibuprofen has the lowest incidence of side effects with the dosage of 200 to 400 mg TDS. Naproxen is more effective than ibuprofen but it has slightly more side effects than ibuprofen. 
But remember, naproxen is still a very safe drug among the NSAIDs and it has less side effects than diclofenac. 500 mg initially, then 200, 250 mg 6 to 8 hourly is given. Naproxen. Ibuprofen, the lowest incidence of side effects. Naproxen, more effective one. Diclofenac has similar efficacy to naproxen, but it has more side effects. So, among diclofenac and naproxen, you should go for naproxen. 75 to 150 mg daily in 2 to 3 divided doses is given. Diclofenac is usually given IM because there have been some reports saying that it causes uh, venous thrombosis and clot formation in the vein. Therefore, it is usually given in IM form. NSAIDs in their injectable form can be given intramuscular and their side effects include pain after getting the injection or in some patients, in few patients, they might form sterile abscess and that is not due to the drug, that is, maybe, that is due to the immune response to the drug that results in the sterile abscess. There is no bacteria in it but the abscess is sterile. Diclofenac is not given IV because there are some case reports about it saying that it can cause venous thromboembolism and clot formation. Ketorolac can be given IV slowly. Initial dose is 10 mg over 10 seconds. Side effects of NSAIDs are very common. Gastric irritation patient with peptic ulcer disease never give NSAIDs. Diarrhea, GI bleeding because they reduce the platelet adhesion, reduce the platelet activity and result in bleeding. So, if a patient is being prepared for surgery in the perioperative area, avoid NSAIDs. They exacerbate asthma because they block the leukotriene pathway. They precipitate acute kidney injury because in acute kidney injury, the prostaglandins maintain the blood flow to the kidney and when you block the prostaglandins, it causes vasoconstriction and the blood flow to the kidney is compromised. AKI in patients with heart failure, cirrhosis, renal failure or just AKI due to any cause, avoid NSAIDs. NSAIDs are contraindicated in patients with recent MI and perioperative period of cabbage. This is very important. Except aspirin, other NSAIDs are contraindicated in patients with recent MI because it increases the risk of MI and stroke in these patients. So, aspirin can be given other than that, other NSAIDs should be avoided if possible. Other than that, NSAIDs are given after meals because NSAIDs block the prostaglandin secretion in the stomach so they can cause ulcers. So, you uh, tell the patient to take these medications after meals and avoid giving NSAIDs to patients that are already taking aspirin because both of them would cause damage to the uh, stomach. And you should add a proton pump inhibitor when you are giving NSAIDs for a longer period of time. NSAIDs impair healing after an injury and they are to be avoided in patients playing professional sport because they can delay the healing process. In these patients, you can go for more topical things. In these patients, you can go for acetaminophen, muscle relaxants and the adjuvant the drugs, not the NSAIDs. Avoid NSAIDs in patients going in the perioperative period, increased risk of bleeding because they inhibit the platelet action. There is a higher risk of anastomotic leak in patients having bowel surgery because they block the prostaglandin, so they slow down the healing process. So, in patients having anastomosis, there is a chances of increased injury uh, and higher risk of anastomotic leak. Now, coming to an important point, with the exception of suspected bowel perforation, opioids are preferred over NSAIDs. In patients having acute abdomen, NSAIDs are usually avoided because NSAIDs block prostaglandins and they stop the normal healing process of the disease. In acute abdomen, the normal healing process is mediated by the prostaglandins and NSAIDs block those. So, in, in, in patients with acute abdomen, you have to prefer opioids over NSAIDs with the exception where you cannot use opioids or the suspected bowel perforation or obstruction. In those cases, opioids further slow down the gut motility. Now, coming to opioids. In the opioids, we have oxycodone, we have hydromorphone, we have tramadol. The doses are as such. Oxycodone immediate release 5 to 30 mg per orally 4 to 6 hours as needed. Hydromorphone 2 to 4 mg per orally every 4 to 6 hours as needed. Tramadol for 50 to 100 mg per orally every 4 to 6 hours as needed. A good thing that you can do is that you can combine the non opioid analgesics, the NSAIDs, with the opioids to reduce the dose of opioids. And you always monitor for respiratory depression in these patients in the first 72 hours because opioids cause respiratory depression, they cause hypotension, they cause constipation. So they have a huge side effect profile. So, what you can do is that you can combine non-opioids with the opioids, so you can give a reduced dose of opioids. 
Tramadol is not recommended in epilepsy patients because Tramadol uh, reduces the seizure threshold in these patients. What are the contraindications of opiates? Opiates are not to be given in asthma because they cause respiratory depression. In bowel obstruction, they slow down the gut motility. Therefore, in bowel obstruction, you do not go for opiates. In bowel obstruction, you can go for in bowel obstruction, you can simply go for paracetamol. Even you should avoid the NSAIDs. Both NSAIDs and opiates are to be avoided in patients having bowel obstruction. In biliary colic, they cause spasm of the sphincter of odi and they further exacerbate the patient condition. In patients with head injury, opiates are to be avoided if needed because they alter the consciousness and they uh, constrict the pupils. And uh, these pupillary responses are very important in patients with head injury because they give us a hint in the diagnosis as well as in the management that whether the patient is responding to the treatment or not. So they alter the consciousness and they cause meiosis. So in head injury patients, they should not be used because they would, they would mask the main symptoms of the condition. Combination analgesics include the combination of opiate with acetaminophen, paracetamol. Combination of hydrocodone with acetaminophen. Combination of hydrocodone with an NSAIDs, ibuprofen. Combination of oxycodone with acetaminophen. Now coming to the big gun, the morphine. Morphine is a very highly used drug and very important drug in the pain management. Morphine is a standard analgesic for severe pain and has been used for centuries. It causes nausea, so you must always give anti-emetics with it like cyclazine, 50 mg IV or IM or you can give pro prochlorperazine, 12.5 mg IM. Anti-emetics might not be needed in children uh, with less than 10 years of age. When you are giving morphine to children less than 10 years of age, they, they are less likely to develop nausea, so you can give it without uh, anti-emetics. How to give morphine? It's very important that you give a slow IV injection and you have to dilute it. 2 mg may be enough for a frail elderly. Now, the dose depends upon the patient. Usually, uh, an elderly patient, a frail elderly, a 2 mg dose might be enough for that patient for pain relief. And sometimes, a young, fit, healthy man, a bodybuilder, in that patient, more than 20 mg may be required to relieve the pain. You have to titrate dose depending on the response. You have to slowly, gradually, initially initiate the doses and then after some 10-15 minutes, you can further repeat the dose and see whether the pain is resolving or not. In children, 100 to 200 microgram per kg is given. You dilute morphine with 0.9 ml normal saline. Each mg of morphine is diluted in 1 ml of normal saline. You label the syringe clearly that this syringe contains morphine and it is to be given slowly. It is given 1 to 2 mg per minute in adults. Now coming to a very important point, the side effects of morphine. In the side effect of morphine, it causes smooth muscle spasm and it can even result in a severe colicky abdominal pain. Pain may mimic a renal colic or GI perforation or an MI. So it causes muscle spasms and severe colicky abdominal pain in some patients. It is to be avoided in patients with biliary colic because it causes spasm of the sphincter of ODI. If the patient develops spasm of the sphincter of ODI and uh, severe pain, it can be relieved by glucagon 1 mg IV and repeated if ne necessary. Uh, and you must have naloxone at hand that even if, if the patient develops respiratory depression or pinpoint pupils, then you can give naloxone immediately as possible. I have talked about opiate overdose treatment in detail in my video on poisoning lectures. You can check out the link of those videos in the description below. Now, this is a beautiful chart from up to date that shows the different doses of different opiates, hydromorphone, morphine, fentanyl, oliseridine. Coming to parenteral opiates, parenteral opiates, these opiates are also available in IV form, tramadol, morphine, hydromorphone, fentanyl, propinorphine. Coming to analgesic suppositories, in the analgesic suppositories in some patients who cannot tolerate oral drug, this can be used in an alternative medication. Acetaminophen suppositories are there. Indomethacine suppositories are available, aspirin suppositories are also available. Topical analgesics. Topical analgesics have lower side effect profile. Lidocaine patches are available, lidocaine jelly is available, lidocaine ointment is available. Patches are given uh, in post herpetic neuralgias. Lidocaine jelly is given if the patient is having painful urethritis. Lidocaine ointment can be given in minor burn, sunburn, abrasion of the skin, and insect bites. In the topical analgesics, diclofenac patch is available acute pain due to minor strain, sprain, contusion, muscular injuries, diclofenac patch can be applied.
diclofenac topical solution or gel for patients having osteoarthritis very common that these osteoarthritis patients will have overdosed themselves with NSAIDs oral NSAIDs and they might have developed proper complications like with GI ulcers and perforations so these patients are to be prescribed with topical analgesics like diclofenac now coming to adjuvant analgesics adjuvant analgesics include muscle relaxants SNRIs TCAs these include uh, anti convulsion drugs like cr for chronic neuropathic pain for chronic neuropathic pain, any anticonvulsants include gabapentin. It is usually given in post herpetic neuralgias. The doses are given here. Pre gabaline 75 mg per orally every 6 to 12 hour diabetic neuropathy, spinal cord neuropathy. Carbamazepine is a drug of choice for patients with trigeminal neuralgia, 100 mg per orally every 12 hour. Other class of drugs include muscle relaxant. Muscle relaxant includes cyclobenzaprine, baclofen. Methocarbamol, paclofen is usually given in patients with tetanus, patients having muscle spasms, and it is also effective in patients having uh, chronic hiccups. Antidepressants include tricyclic antidepressants like uh, amitriptyline. They have they resolve the neuropathic pain. Clomipramine, doxepine. The main drug is amitriptyline. But remember, take care of the anticholinergic side effects, especially in old people. SNRIs, uh, serotonin, norepinephrine, reuptake inhibitors, duloxetine, venlafaxine, they are also used in neuropathic pain, especially patients having diabetic neuropathy. Duloxetine is usually prescribed 30 to 60 mg per orally once daily. In summary, WHO analgesic ladder step 1 include non-opiate analgesics and they are continued till the step 4. With that, the other drugs are added. Non-opiate analgesia, acetaminophen, NSAIDs, ibuprofen, naproxen, first-line drugs, diclofenic cannot be given, IV, more side effects, NSAIDs uh, cause painful sterile abscesses, sometimes if given IV, but most of the times they can be given safely. Side effects of NSAIDs include gastric irritation being the most important one, avoid in and patients with asthma, avoid in patients with MI, patients going to for cabbage, NSAIDs cause increased risk of bleeding, avoid in perioperative uh, time, the opiate drugs, bromodol not recommended in epilepsy patient, the contraindications of opiates, different combination analgesics, when giving morphine, give antiemetic, not required in children less than 10 years of age, how to give morphine and uh, you dilute it, the side effects of morphine, severe colicky abdominal pain, the other alternative drugs like analgesic suppositories, topical analgesics, lidocaine ointment, Diclofenic topical gel for patients with osteoarthritis. Patients with uh, carb trigeminal neuralgia receive carbamazepine and muscle relaxant drugs like baclofen, antidepressant, amitriptyline, main one, duloxetine being the main drug in SNRIs used for neuropathic pain. If you liked my video, please click on the subscribe button and check out my other videos on emergency medicine lectures, ECG lectures, neurology lectures. I have different playlists on my channel. Hope you would have found this video very helpful. Thank you very much.